we've gone to Ivy League schools that have been around since the beginning of our country and helped with some rebranding internally for things with them. So I get an institution. We've rebranded institutions. That's that's a challenge, let me tell you. We've, we've taken national companies and done a rebrand and then had to delicately, we call them wounded birds sometimes, and, and, and had to help heal and release them out into, into the next century, right? Some of my favorite projects, they're, they're, I could talk about those for days. Uh, but, uh, but I talked about shaping perception, but at a certain point as your brand grows, it is going to have an evolution. Some of it is, is going to be not what you expect. Some of it is going to be what customers are you attracting and hopefully they're the right ones. And so at a certain point, yes, customer service absolutely is critical. And at a certain point, you're going to start asking your customers more and you're going to start having an internal marketing strategy as you grow. So that changes you from a startup, either a startup or a newly rebranded company. And so some of your brand attributes, what people know about you is going to be shaped by your customers. So you're going to take those good things. And so, so some of your evolution will happen during another phase. From cave drawings to family histories to stories around the fire, humans crave order among chaos, connection amid isolation. So we tell stories. Our mission at the Storytellers Network is to bring the art of story to the masses. Whether you're in marketing, you're an entrepreneur, or you're developing your own personal brand, telling your story effectively can make the difference between celebrating milestones and collecting unemployment. The Storytellers Network strives to help storytellers tell their stories so you can learn from the best. Now, your host, the inbound evangelist himself, Dan Moyle. So welcome to the Storytellers Network Podcast Season 1. I'm glad you are joining me today. In this episode, we hear from an entrepreneur who's always been interested in fostering connections and finding an audience in both marketing and music fields, actually. Uh, you'll hear why that's actually not that unique, which I found fascinating. Uh, anyway, now as the CEO of the Artist Evolution, which is actually a marketing design and practice management firm that he founded back in 07, uh, Derek Champagne actually helps businesses of all budgets design and implement marketing strategies that work. And he really does it. In fact, he once told me that uh, what sets his agency apart is the execution of the ideas, not just a bunch of brainstorming. They actually execute and that sets them apart. Um, he's also an author, which is why he's on season one of the storytellers. And he's a podcaster. He's definitely a storyteller, even if he doesn't think so himself. And today, Derek shares his story. Now, before we do get into today's conversation, just a reminder, find us online at thestorytellersnetwork.com for more episodes, how to contact us uh, for other resources to help you tell your story, all that kind of good stuff. And if you like what we're doing here, please consider leaving us a review. It helps us reach new storytellers, whether it's an Apple podcast on Facebook and Stitcher, wherever you want to leave a review, we'll take the compliment that, or, or I will, I guess. Uh, and a big thank you as well to Podcast Pilot and Casterly for supporting this movement. If you want experts on the podcast world, like maybe how to start your very own show, uh, talk to the teams headed up by the amazing Jamie J and Sarah Parrish. Now, let's get to the stories. So that's the intro. As uh, you know, I, I've known Derek for a while. I'm a big fan of his book. Obviously, as I mentioned, there's Don't Buy a Duck right there. So, um, so Derek, welcome to the show, man. Happy to have you here. Dan, thanks for having me. I love the concept. We were talking before the show and I think it's such a cool concept that you're doing this. So congratulations on your success so far. Oh, thanks, man. I appreciate it. And, uh, and you and I, you know, we, we've talked uh, a few times, obviously, as, a, as business associates, as a client of ours at Interview Valet, but also uh, we had dinner together out in um, Anaheim last year. And just, I, I love your story. I love the idea that you're more than a CEO, you're an author, you're a podcaster, you're a you know, musician, you, you tell stories and talk to people. So I'm excited to have you on board um, and, and just and bring that to all the Storyteller Network uh, listeners. Mm, thank you. So let's start with, uh, I like to set the stage as it were and uh, talk about where everybody is because to me, storytelling can happen anywhere. So where are you geographically, man? I am currently, I'm geographically in Northwest Arkansas. We call it the Ozark Mountains. It's uh, also referred to as Walmart country because this is where the headquarters of Walmart, Sam's, Tyson, a lot of other industry is the world headquarters of Walmart here in the mountains. So there's, there's actually a lot of business and, and commerce happening here. A lot of entrepreneurship uh, in the middle of nowhere in the country. Yeah. And it's almost like you looked at my notes because I, I, I wanted to ask you this with Walmart being so close and all those companies that support it and the ones that you mentioned, it has to be a very busy landscape for you as an agency, huh? Yeah, it is. But we actually work outside of the Walmart world. So it's interesting is tomorrow night I'm at a, at a, an event with 2000 business people and the, the Waltons, all, all the people are, they're there at these events. It's our town. 
Uh, but you know, for the growth of Walmart, as you know, happened in the last 20 plus years and this at the scale it did. So it was always a little bit more quiet here in this town until I think it was 2008 when Walmart, maybe it was 2007, Walmart made a requirement that every vendor in the world that wanted to do business with Walmart had to have a physical office in Bentonville or in Northwest Arkansas. Hmm. And so you can imagine the gold rush of growth from, and then the growth beyond that of dentists and everyone else who came to town. So it's still a nice small community, about 500,000 people in, this, in, in, the, in the towns combined. Uh, but yes, it's a great rich area as far as uh, the opportunity for marketing uh, and clients. That's cool. So have you, so let me ask you this. Do you consider yourself a storyteller to begin with? That's a great question. And, and I, I, uh, you know, I, I, no, I don't really, I, I would say in real life, if you sit with me and we have dinner together, which we have, I love to tell stories. So if we're going that basic, yes, it's just, a, it's a natural part of my, of my DNA, but not a professional storyteller other than I've been a musician for most of my life. And when I really started thinking about it, you know, what's more storytelling than to write a song? Mm. Absolutely. And that's, but my hope with the Storytellers Network is to talk to songwriters, you know, professional songwriters at some point too, because I do, I, I agree. I love the story behind songs. So, and you can tell it too, I think through writing actual music, right? I mean, you can. I, I, I agree. I think storytelling is, is uh, I, my outlet. And my kids, will, my kids know this because when dad's in the music room, we have this music room in our house with, 15 guitars, you go in there, there's, I mean, it's, it's a music space. Nice. And, and it is, it is obviously I'm a family guy, but it's probably the most important room for me to, uh, to unwind in. And, and my kids know that they know when dad's playing, they come in and play with me, but dad needs that time. Mm -hmm. Since I can remember of being alive, I, my expression was to grab an instrument, good times and bad and use that to, to have my outlet. So for me, without any words, sometimes that's a story. So did that play any kind of an effect on your professional life of helping others tell their stories? Yeah, it absolutely did. I was on stage for the first time at three years old. My parents were part-time touring musicians. My brother and I would take turns going on the road with them and doing sound at five, six years old. And, and so we, we had from an early, early, early on, we watched what it was like to, for my parents to tell stories. Uh, my uncles were in, my uncle and aunt were in the band, another uncle, my parents, it was just, it was the late seventies and it's not that surprising, mm -hmm. that type of music. And uh, my mom wrote over 400 songs. So keep in mind, I grew up watching my mom play and teach all my cool guitar player friends how to play. Nice. My dad played harmonica and bass. My brother's a music pastor in Kansas city. It just runs in our family. So early on, always part of my fiber was that music and storytelling through music was just part of my life. So Fast forward years later, and, and I was a musician in Hollywood for many years. I had an entertainment marketing company along the way. I was an entrepreneur as well, but uh, it did direct my path even to today where I have an agency called The Artist Evolution. Do you think that that whole musician side of things and that, that I have to imagine it's kind of a, a tough life at times. It can be amazing, but it has to be a little bit difficult and you have to be independent, so to speak, right? Did that play a part in being an entrepreneur then too? Yeah, it, it can be, you, you, first of all, you have to be entrepreneurial to do music as well, but I'll tell you, and you know this, and, and I think you play music some too, don't you? A little bit, yeah. Yeah. Well, the, you know, I have a lot of music friends and, uh, and the majority of them are not entrepreneurial, right? <laughs> Those that really, they, they, and a lot of the best musicians and artists that I know are kind of uh, self-sabotaging a lot of times. So rather than being entrepreneurial, they're in a continual state of, of, uh, turmoil and that's how they write best when things are good they're not at their happiest mm -hmm. now that's not all artists but think of your favorite artists the ones that have done had a big footprint on art even even actual painters they've got a lot of turmoil right mm -hmm. so I always had a conflict internally where business and music were equal loves of mine so I managed bands out in Hollywood I managed bands from the age of 12 on and so there was always a conflict for me of do I love business or music more and they always were a tension point because they don't mix well right yeah. They don't always mix well. When they do, there's a great, you see great success. So, but you know, when you're managing a band, it's hard to keep all those artists on track. So. <laughs> but so, so what, what other ways are there to, to tell stories then? You mentioned painting, you mentioned obviously music, you know, when it comes to business and marketing. I mean, what are some other, it, as we're talking, does anything come to mind as far as storytelling goes? We're like, yeah, you know what? That's a great way to tell a story. Yeah. I mean, there's so many ways. And as you know, my profession is helping shape brand stories, mm -hmm. but I think, I think really it goes so much deeper than that. And that's why I think we're talking more about on the personal level, because when you understand that you can apply it to a brand because we're all consumers of brands. So I think it's really common sense. That's why marketing 
seems so easy to me a lot of times is it's not that difficult if you approach it in a very uh, with the humanity about it mm -hmm. but i think all the arts are the biggest ways i see of telling stories the more i think about it the painters the the writers the i mean there's even video storytelling i mean there's so many ways to tell the story mm -hmm. um and i also love i love the the authentic old school storytelling too. think campfire think passing generation generation i used to not care for that as much maybe i just didn't appreciate it now i'm turning i'm 42 so maybe i'm at my halfway point in life <laughs> and now there's maybe i'm romanticizing it but now I, the thought of, of of a world war ii veteran sitting down and passing on their experiences and their history onto the next generation just i could get them i could get teary-eyed about it because mm -hmm. i think there's something so beautiful about that oh absolutely yeah I got to do an event recently and this event we're doing tomorrow night for a diabetes association and we're helping raise money. And I got to, I got a banjo from, from my grandpa that he got around that he got it in the early 1900s. He got it used during the great depression. So my grandpa's first generation in the United States, first language is French, trying to learn the language has to drop out of school at 12 years old to go work full time and dumpster dive to find food during the Great Depression. Wow. And then fast forward all these years later, he's, he's long past. <clears throat> Here I am in Bentonville, Arkansas, this giant fundraiser holding that banjo, hmm. just the story of that instrument. And I got to tell the story in front of all these leaders about how uh, about how my grandpa passed down three things to us. He passed down music, he passed down entrepreneurship, and then the third thing we're trying to end is diabetes. But the, but the banjo just wove in. The banjo's probably been around since the turn of the century, of the last century. So the stories through pieces that have meaning to individuals is just, it's just so rich to me. I, I, it's probably one of my favorite things right now is, is that personal story and connection someone has with an object or with something small that can pass on. Which inspires me to think about it this way too, is um, for those listening, you know, if you're a storyteller, don't be, don't be discouraged that if you're only telling a story as a, let's say a social media marketing manager or whatever specialist, right? You can tell those stories in other areas. I remember when I was in a mortgage company doing uh, marketing. And so of course, you know, marketing for a mortgage is not exactly the sexiest thing alive, right? <laughs> right. Um, but, but we got to create a video for the March of Dimes, the local March of Dimes event to help tell the story about a family and this kind of thing. So like, it's just, it's amazing to be able to use that, that drive, that talent, that passion to help others tell stories. So, yeah, I love it. And I do think, you know, when we, when we dig more into the, into the, the business side, which I actually, this is so refreshing to get to talk to you a lot about a lot of non-business things. Cause I'm so much a guest talking about marketing all the time. Right. <laughs> and, and I love the whole other side of things. Um, but when you, but that just applies so much to the business side as well, to marketing. Everything is about making a connection, emotional connection, making a connection and being relevant and, and storytelling is the best way to do that. Oh, absolutely. And so as a consumer, as maybe even a personal side of it, uh, or as a business consumer, what is your favorite way to take in a story then? Uh, I love, I love video. The reason I like video is because I get so many elements of it, but I'll tell you the way that th that's one way. But another way that again, I'm appreciating as I get older, is is in person yeah because i love that connection and, and video like this helps mm -hmm. like we're talking right now which is amazing that we can talk face to face it feels like but think of think of going to a theater production and 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 sitting with others and they're telling you in a story i'm trying to remember when we saw not too long ago maybe it was a white christmas or something like that but it was a story that they've been telling it's been touring nationwide it's on broadway they've been telling it for 50 years yet i got to bring my kids there a few months ago around Christmas time and the same thing that my great grandparents were watching in real, in, in real life, they were actually watching it. Those same people passed it down and then they presented to us. So I love the arts in that way because what an amazing way to see a story and see it continue to be. And it's just that interaction of people to people is just really powerful. So, so you keep going back to, to art in, in that, that deep connection that you have to it, whether it's through your family or through your enjoyment of it with your, your family now, how, but you mentioned too, Derek, about having that balance between business and, and art. How, how do you strike that balance? Yeah, well, I'm a strategy guy. Our business, the focus that our business does is we build strategic marketing playbooks mm -hmm. and we help with implementation. Now that doesn't sound very seen arts, does it? <laughs> but we're called the artist evolution. So there really is a need for a balance of creativity and the art side and the connection but it has to marry some point in business. It has to marry with strategy, implementation, and execution. There's just no way around it. They have to come together uh, because there has to be systems and processes and implementation and, and, has to, and the execution part is critical. So there is a place for it, but they have to work together. 
and and one void of the other is really just not a very good story and not a good campaign in business. They've got to work together. So do you think that comes from two sides of the brain? I mean, are you really using the analytical and the artist together to create this really cool magic middle place? Absolutely. Yeah. We always start, what, what our business sells is that we don't sell, right? We say we're the third party advocate. We come in neutral. That's our sale. So, and I always tell clients, I'm like, we're about to sell you that we don't sell you. So get ready. <laughs> we have no agenda. We're not trying to sell you a website. We're not trying to sell you a specific campaign. We're selling you a playbook. But in that, and the way we're building it is really starting from us going back to the basics and saying, here's who you are and here's who your end consumer is and let's find a way to build bridges between the two of you so that you can coexist and talk together and, and live together in harmony and you and, and, and actually break bread together and do business together. And right. part of that is the creative side, right? And the other part of it is building a strategy. So yeah, absolutely though. The, you've got to use both sides, uh, both sides of the brain and it, it helps for us having a good team that can, uh, uh, can go objectively and look and say, what is really, what does this client really want to do? What, who are they really trying to reach and why? What does that customer really want? And then making it all about the customer from there. And, and I, I'm, I'm just enjoying this conversation. I'm, I'm loving how you tell the stories. I love the idea of the, your grandpa's banjo. Um, you are an effective storyteller. And, and even if you don't consider yourself that, you're good. What do you love though? What do you get out of telling stories? Whether it's in person like that or through a podcast, what, what do you love about storytelling? There's two things. One is it's, it's therapeutic for me hmm. to share it. Another is, is I, I've experienced this over the years is how it can engage, empower, and influence somebody else. Hmm. And I've seen it in a positive and negative way. So there's been times in my life where I might have not have been in the best spot or best mood where I maybe have told a story in a way that was not a great impact. It gave me relief but it did not build up the person or the people around me. Mm -hmm. So being an intentional storyteller, being intentional about your brand, being intentional about how you are, how you're out there and how you, how you uh, have relationships uh, can be extremely powerful. So that's probably my favorite thing, what it does for me, selfish, and then seeing what it can do for other people. So powerful. What's more powerful than having relevancy to somebody else. And you do that when you tell a story. And if you can make a connection in a story, then you've suddenly uh, empowered somebody else to go out there and learn from it. And then also to uh, go out and share it with others. Yeah. And, and I, I like the idea of being selfless, but also having that selfish side of things. I mean, if it feels good to do it, keep doing it. Right. And, and that's, that's okay as an artist. But, well, and you don't have to force me to tell a story. You have to, I have to try to bite my tongue to stop. Right. And, <laughs> and, and that's, I think there is a difference though, between, I hope there is between somebody that won't shut up and somebody that has a really cool story that people are sitting there waiting and want to hear uh, and walk away feeling energized and going, man, and they're telling it to others. Right. Uh, and so I think there's a difference and it's, it's important to know the difference between the two for yourself whenever you're out there. Yeah. Self-awareness, right. Important. It's important. Anything. Yes. <clears throat> so, so on the, on the other side of that, that's what you love about it. What do you find challenging about storytelling? You know, if I step back and look at it from a, from a brand standpoint, from a bigger standpoint, I, I think, it can be challenging sometimes. And I think this might lead into some other questions that I'm, I have a feeling you might ask me about social and some of those things because they're everywhere is to be authentic. Mm. There, there is a, there is a desire. There is a, almost a, almost a requirement now to push a resume, to push the story bigger, to capture everything. And social does that. And, and Hey, I'm on social media every week. I have a LinkedIn video I do each week. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm commenting on other people's things. We're, well, all of us are out there. You're out there. But I think the, to be authentic is really important. And, and the lines can get blurred sometimes with how we can magnify and all be rock stars with social media instantly by, by having our own platforms and tribes. So important to be authentic and know why and what we're doing whenever we share something. And, and what is that, <clears throat> what does that mean for you, for Derek Champagne, for the artist evolution, for you as a storyteller, personally and professionally, what does authenticity come down to for you? How, how do you get to that point? Yeah. And I'll tell you that for a couple of years ago, it was different for me. Uh, and, and then it is now. And I think people evolve and that's good. Um, I've had a real big transformation in my life anyway. If you think that, you know, 14 years ago, I was a Hollywood, I was 
playing bass at Johnny Depp's club. I was, I was managing musicians out there in, in Hollywood. I was touring. I was, I, was, I, I was an entrepreneur too, but that was my focus. So to go from that now to me being in Northwest Arkansas, a family guy, having my business, I'm a community leader. I've got a, you know, a podcast and a radio show all about leadership and intentionality. And there's a big shift. Those are, those are two different Derek's. They're the same one, but there's been an evolution throughout the process. So now to me though, it really looks like about even though my picture and my face is on a lot of stuff, like all of us that are doing these things, it really is that it's not, it cannot be about me. So my criteria has to say is, am I doing this so that I can uh, have that placebo effect of seeing the, the, the more likes? Am I doing this so that I can build myself up or am I putting this out there because I'm, I'm working with someone else to build value because what I'm sharing is going to build value. And so even my strategy now with, uh, and I say strategy because it does balance again with the art, even my strategy for the way I have guests on my show is to, and you're doing the same thing, is to not make it about me, hmm. to make them the star. And if you do that in an authentic way, I think that's the important balance is for me. Others, others need to build their brand different ways. But for me, it's, it's am I being authentic and, and am I making it about others and putting the spotlight on them and truly building relationships? And if, my, if, and if that's my criteria and I'm honoring that each time, then I can confidently go out there and push what I'm doing. Because our type personalities are we want to be out front and center, not even get the spotlight, but because we just want to see what's going on. I'm curious. Oh, yeah. I want to be, I want to see what's going on, on the front lines. I want to be a part of it. I want to have a microphone and I want to be asking questions and answering questions. And I want to see what I want to be part of the movement. Right. That's, and so yeah. that's okay. But we just want to, I just, I just need to make sure that my filters that it's coming from the right place. And there is a need to continue to check that because you can start to, to check your numbers. How many oh. views did my video get? Right. Who cares? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. I mean, you care, but move on. If you have good content and you're doing the right thing, then, then uh, you don't really have to worry so much about views. Oh yeah. Well, you know, you could, you could get a million views and it doesn't matter to anybody or you could change one person's life. What do you want? Yeah. I mean, and right. really, I mean, at the end of the day, I do a lot on LinkedIn. What if LinkedIn changes tomorrow and all that time investment I put into it, it brought, it's brought in for a year, 60% of our business's business. We do a lot on that platform. I'm like, okay, well, I'm getting going to get to 20,000 dedicated tribe. And then after that, but who cares? And you, someone else comes behind and goes, oh, that's great. I've got 250,000. You're like, how, how did you, and that happened to me not too long ago. And the guy, he got grandfathered in. They, he within like a month had 250,000 LinkedIn followers. And here I am at wow. 16 going, I got 60. Who cares? It means nothing. And if LinkedIn changes tomorrow, that platform's gone, right? Mm -hmm. So if your message and your core building relationships is strong, it, you, you'll find the right platforms for it. But it doesn't have to go away when one social thing changes. Yeah. And when it comes to all that social media, do you find it... Um, do you find each platform has a different way of using them for storytelling? I mean, absolutely. And you know that cause you use it as, as well. You're, you're an expert on it. Yeah. I mean, we use it for our clients and yeah, absolutely. I mean, depending on the type of product and service and, and there is a different way to tell the story. There's a different way of being appropriate and keeping attention. I mean, Snapchat's going to be different than, than using LinkedIn. Right. Mm -hmm. And we do all of those. We do, we do geofencing campaigns on Snapchat and, and all kinds of stuff there, but that's, that's just a different, shorter attention span. I will note this uh, storytelling, how it's changed is you got to tell your story fast mm -hmm. now, especially with social. You've yeah. got to make it relevant fast. Why should someone care? And that, that goes to that balance again of ego and why are you doing it? Um, but to have to gain traction and to have someone listen, you've got to know how to tell your story quickly and make a connection quickly. Yeah. Um, so, so you, you obviously appreciate uh, other people's storytelling, Derek, and, and you've worked collaboratively with, with bands, you work with clients, this kind of thing. If somebody comes to you and they say, man, I've got a great story. Uh, where, where do you start with them to help them tell their story? You know, that's a great question. And I'll say this, I mean, honestly, people don't necessarily come up to me and say, I've got a great story. Okay. And I would say probably that the best storytellers that I've seen have not said that. I say that and now I'm going to go backtrack because I had somebody that I respect, really respect, who's one of the top brand builders in the world, I would say. And they were in my office a few months ago and they said, Derek, you've written this book. And, and this is someone that I would never expect to consult with me on this because, they, I mean, they're up here to me. And, uh, and they said, I'd I wrote a book. I wrote a story. And I'd love for you to take a look at it. And they had a fully developed book. In it. And I said, I'll take a look at it. And I get that a lot, like many of us do in this business. We interview a lot of authors, you do too. So mm -hmm. we, we got more books than we know what to do with, right? <laughs> this story floored me. It was, it, is, it, is, it was an instant, what I think could be an instant cult classic. You, 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 Dan, are going to love this book because it ties in advertising. It ties in the, the, the madman type of world. It ties in real world experience of some high level advertisers. It takes a road trip. There's a black box. There's a desert. There's all these things. 
it's amazing. I'm in. <laughs> it, I'm in. So, so I would say that was an unexpected surprise. And I, we gave some little tweaks on how to, how to make the story more relevant at the end and things like that. But otherwise, it was beautiful. Um, I, I will say this. So for brands, brands often come to us and say, I need help telling my story. And for them, we really go back to marketing basics of saying, do you really understand who you are? What, who, who are you really about? Do you really understand who you're talking to and, and what you're saying to them? And these are, these are marketing basics. In my book, I call it the brands Bermuda Triangle. Mm-hmm. Who are you? Who are they? Right? Understanding that. Who's your competition? Who's the villain in the story? Right? <laughs> so, so identify the players. So that's one of my piece of advice is let's know who the players are in the story. Who are the characters? Your, you are. Your product is. The competition is. The landscape matters. You asked me where I was from. Geography matters sometimes. And I've actually seen customers that don't know who their customers ge- geographically. Mm-hmm. How are you, where are you, how are you supposed to advertise and talk to them? Yeah. How do you tell your story if you don't know where you're supposed to tell it? So, so I want to, I want to dive into something that you, you mentioned this and it piqued my interest branding. So I have this idea in my head that I think is a little bit contrarian to what some of our marketing friends talk about branding with. Um, and it's, and it's actually created some, some conflict for me in past jobs. <laughs> um, Love it. So, so I want to hear a little bit from you, Derek, about, about branding. And what that really means to you, like, yeah. you know, because I mean, I, I, I anticipate some listeners are, are marketers, some listeners are brand managers, maybe some listeners um, are, are, are storytellers, writers or musicians that want to get their brand and air quotes out there. But what does branding mean to you? How can you explain it to, to the lay yeah. person? This is what I, and again, I am, I hope, and you've read my book, mm-hmm. I try to communicate in a way that is that I'm not this elite marketer. Mm, I know absolutely. marketing well because I've been doing it for years. I've reviewed over a thousand brands. But my goal always when I have a conversation with anyone, whether they're a marketing expert or, or beginner, is that we just have an authentic conversation. Mm-hmm. And because at the end of the day, if we have a real conversation, chances are we can help each other in some way. There's no posturing needed, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. What does that do for anybody? Branding for me is really simple. It is what your target knows about you. That's it. That's all it is. That is, that is, I'm telling you, I'll argue with anybody about that. That's all, Mm -hmm. that's all it really is. Well, my brand has this and my customers don't even know about it. We don't have a brand because your brand is what people know about you. So let's, let me give you an example. Starbucks. Mm -hmm. That's all I have to say. I give that example in my book. When I say the word and you think about the brand, whether you love them or not, if you like them right away, you're thinking, I like the sound of the, the coffee being made here in the sound. I see people sitting with computers. I see little friendly meetings going on. I see the hipsters in the corner doing their thing. <laughs> As if, if they're still going to Starbucks, yeah. uh, I, I've can, you, can know, you can taste your favorite scone. You can smell the aroma. And it's, that's consistent. Even when you go to an airport Starbucks, it's pretty consistent. So they have a brand with their customers. It's what their customer perceives. I don't mind Starbucks. When I lived in LA, it was Starbucks and coffee bean. And man, it was a love hate. I don't, I have no skin in the game. I like a good cup of coffee. I'm okay with Starbucks. And, uh, and so consider me, I know their brand. I know it well and I like it. So for me, what does your brand, what does your target customer know about you? That simple. There's all kinds of layers of branding we can get into, but to answer your question, I think it's that simple. I, I like that simplicity. Now, now can it be, can a, can a company or a brand or a business or a person or whatever force that and, and direct that? Or is it more of a perception thing? Or is it a mix? Okay, you, you nailed it. I, <laughs> I was actually going to go into that. I was wondering. So force it? No. I use the word shape. Hmm. Can you shape perception? Yes. I was on a podcast recently where they said, well, is that, is that authentic? Is that ethical? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. It's not. And when you're doing your, your unique value proposition, when we're building vision statements for companies, when we're building out who they're going to be, their brand value statements for the next five, 10 years, we do that all of all those things in a, in a playbook for clients from startups to some big brands out there, household brands. And we say you have a chance to shape perception. It's got to be authentic. But we're, how do we desire? What moods and emotions do we want them to experience when they interact with us? When they see us, when they brush up against us, when they walk by us, when their family walks by us, how do we want them to feel? What moods or emotions, what adjectives and phrases, what feelings, all those things. We go through all those exercises. And so if we're not there yet, that's okay. But let's work that direction. Because a brand, again, is what someone knows about you. And if they don't know about you, you can shape what they know about you and make sure that your culture and your team and everything lives up to that. So that actually helps you to do those exercises. And then if you're not living up to that, then make some changes. Do some reverse engineering and make sure that your brand starts having those values. So yeah, absolutely. Shape perception. You should do that. Um, That's really critical in a lot of personal branding as well. Mm -hmm. You see all these cowboys out there with confusing brands. And uh, it's important to be intentional with how you shape. 
Yeah. Intentional and shaping. I like that. Cause so here's, here's my take on it. And I don't, I don't often get on my soapbox on, on the show at this point, but, <laughs> but I'm geeking out, I'm geeking out with you. So I love here. So here's my thing. I, I, I once worked with someone who, who basically said, this is our brand and this is who people are going to know us as, and we're going to, we're going to force it basically. And I thought, you know, branding is, um, I like what you said, Derek, about what, what your customers know about you, but I also go even a step, maybe, I don't know if it's down or what, but I, I say it's, it's customer service. Right. Whether that's actual customer service, whether it's how you interact, whether it's, you know, interview valet, Tom is the face and always has been. If he's a complete jerk, then that's going to be our brand. And so it's that that authentic um, connection, that customer service side of things that if if our systems and everything else don't work, then I I don't care how much of a brand I want to shape. It's terrible. Right. And so I go back to that side of it. Whereas if I can get those systems in place at, at, a, at a company and say, okay, here's your system, here's your service, here's your, your culture that you've helped to create, your brand is going to basically, it's going to be easy. I agree marketing. with you. And you reminded me, thank you. That, that's a great point. And you, what you reminded me of, and I feel like I had this conversation recently with somebody is what I mentioned of the shape and perception. Think of that as an early stage. Think of that as a rebrand. Like we've gone to We've gone to Ivy League schools that have been around since the beginning of our country and helped with some rebranding internally for things with them. So I get an institution. We've rebranded institutions. That's, that's a challenge, let me tell you. We've, we've taken national companies and done a rebrand and then had to delicately, we call them wounded birds sometimes, and, and, and had to help heal and release them out into, into the next century, right? Some of my favorite projects. They're, they're, I could talk about those for days. Uh, but, uh, but I talked about shaping perception. But at a certain point as your brand grows, it is going to have an evolution. Some of it is, is going to be not what you expect. Some of it is going to be what customers are you attracting and hopefully they're the right ones. And so at a certain point, yes, customer service absolutely is critical. And at a certain point, you're going to start asking your customers more and you're going to start having an internal marketing strategy as you grow. So that changes you from a startup, either a startup or a newly rebranded company. And so some of your brand attributes, what people know about you, is going to be shaped by your customers. So you're going to take those good things. And so, so some of your evolution will happen during another phase. Mm. And so I always watch that distinction of going, okay, now let's talk with our customers. What are they loving about what we're doing? And when there's some things you didn't expect. So remember we're shaping perception, but there's new things we didn't expect. Those are just, those are brand attributes that are bonuses. And then that, that helps you shape even more what your brand's become. And that's some of the unexpected evolution that I absolutely love about branding. Yeah. I could geek out all day on that stuff. Um, <laughs> Me too. Sorry. So, no, that's okay, man. That's good. Hopefully the listeners enjoy it. Um, and, and it's helpful. I mean, I, I think it's helpful anyway, because I think, I think, you know, we see these words, we, th- we see authentic, we see brand, we see story out in the world and social media and wherever. And like, what does that mean? How do I get there? So this, this has been awesome. Um, so let's go back to storytelling a little bit, Eric. What, yeah. what is your favorite story, whether it's personal or professional? Do you have, do you have a favorite story? Hmm. That's a great, that's a tough one. Um, if I'm thinking back to myself, to one of my own stories, you know, I, you know, I'm not sure I love some old stories. Again, I'm nostalgic these days, maybe being a dad, but I, I love some thinking of stories of like my parents talking about when they were kids, you know, those things. So I would say my favorite stories right now are kind of in dad mode where I'm telling, where my kids are still at the eight, six and eight years old, where right now they actually give a hoot what dad did, right? <laughs> I, I got a small window from what I hear and I'm taking it. So they're, they're just looking at my six-year-old son and my daughter are looking at me in awe when I share a story like dad did what? Mm-hmm. Right. So I can share something really basic. Like, did you know that uncle, your uncle Brandon and I were to, you know, to, to heat the house, we used to go out and get wood. And so here's what we would do. It'd be raining. We'd go out and get the wood. We'd dry it off. We'd bring, you did that. You know? So I think the little stories are my favorite to tell because of my captive audience that appreciates it. So, um, yeah. but otherwise, you know, I love telling stories of my fun war stories or talking about my music days of, mm. of, the, you know, I think a lot of us, if we've, even if we have had a career shift or not, we've had that, ideal spot in the fun part of our career, which I love what I'm doing now, but there was a spot where, where, I mean, I was playing music at midnight shows and all. And so I love telling the war stories of that. And it's fun getting together with my old music buddies. We meet about once a month to play music. And, and those are some fun stories going, you remember when we, remember when we played Tempe, Arizona, or you remember when we went overseas and played the, and so those are the fun ones because it just, uh, you just go back to that place in time. Think of that with your best buddies that you've had. The, it could be a, so when you've been, you've, uh, served in the military with it could be someone you played music with it could be someone you went to college with but those are fun stories because it takes you to a moment in time you can hear a song 
And that's where that song recollection comes in. We had the Jim Blossoms, Jim Blossoms playing in our event tomorrow night. Oh, and, and right away, we had a client in the studio that's about my age. I said, tell me the top three hits. Boom, boom, boom. She knew all three. I'm like, that's right. <laughs> and, she, and she was like, I remember when I was driving my car doing this. I'm like, exactly. It mm -hmm. takes you back to that place in time. So those kind of stories are my favorite because you feel like you're there. It can raise the hair on your arm when you hear them oh, sometimes. Yeah. You're like, I'm there. I'm there oh, right yeah. now. That's powerful. It is. And, and that's what I, that's what I love about stories so much is it, it, they can be so powerful, whether it's positive or negative, it can take you there. In yeah. fact, I just discovered on Netflix, the show, everything sucks. I haven't seen it. Oh man. So are you, are you a binge? Are you a Netflix stream? Oh yes, guy? absolutely. Okay. Yes. So on Netflix, everything sucks is it's a 10 episode series right now. I don't know if they're going to do season two or not, but hmm. it's, it takes place in 96 and it's high school. And so oh, you said Jim awesome. Blossoms, man, I went right there because they just played <laughs> that's it. That's awesome. It was so that's cool. But yeah, it takes I you right check there. That out. Huh? Yeah, it's good. Yeah, I'm going to check that one out. That's awesome. Um, so that, I mean, yeah, I, I love how powerful stories can be, that connection, um, whether it's, and, and it can go into branding too. I mean, we, you know, marketers ruin everything, um, but, <laughs> but, but we also help make those connections. Is that, out of all your marketing stories, has there been a moment, do you think, that you've made that connection where you look back and you go, holy, that was amazing. I can't believe we made that connection for that brand. Yeah, I'll, I'm going to tell you, uh, yeah, that has happened a few times for us. I, I give a few, ex a few examples in my book about that, but I think mm -hmm. one of my personal ones that was, the, that was out of body, out of, out of experience for me was being this, this you know, I, I went from the, the music industry to, to, to back to the corporate America uh, to working for an, a large agency or an agency with all massive clients to starting my own agency. And I was kind of an upstart. I'm the music guy, which, you know, we realized later that was not as much of an upstart as I thought so many musicians start agencies. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I thought that was original, right? And uh, there's actually a big connection to musicians starting agencies. But, uh, but, but kind, of my, kind of my moment in my story where I was like, this something big is happening here is, is uh, when we got called to do an Ivy League, a big Ivy League school. And I'm talking, I mean, one of the biggest ones, I don't say their name, just although it's on our website, but, and I remember being there at the, in, uh, on the East coast <laughs> and, uh, and going up on the elevator with the, with the CEO of this large company that brought me in to, to help actually to help kind of save the project. Mm -hmm. They needed a brand guy to come in because it was a confusing thing. wearing the colors of the school up the elevator. And, uh, I'm, I'm looking above this campus where presidents and all these people go to and meeting with the leaders of it. And we walk out and the, we walk out of the thing. I do an hour or 45 minute presentation, walk out and the, the CEO on the way to the elevator back down just looks at me and says, we nailed it. High fives me. This girl that was with us for that company, she pulled me aside. She said, he's never done that. He doesn't express himself that way. <laughs> and so, and so that started a massive project for us, but that was one of my big moments. That was one of my favorite stories in marketing. Now that wasn't necessarily changed for the client, but we've, I've got so many stories of seeing the client get results that are exciting. Um, that, that is fun too, that I, that I love, but storytelling, whenever we mess with a brand, whenever we change a brand in any way that gives it better traction because they're telling a better story, that's always meaningful. And we do that on so many different campaigns. So, so let's, let's with that, obviously you had that a huge win. You've got tactical uh, knowledge, you've got strategic, strategic knowledge, strategery, right? Um, strategery, I love it. <laughs> uh, so, so let's symbiotically, no, I don't know. Anyway, um, cut the BS, right? right. I, I want to I give, give a little bit of a something to the listeners of in this noisy landscape, tons of social media, and, and if Facebook goes away, what do we do? Or they change the algorithm, now what? Um, it's, I, I always feel like it's daunting to get my story out, whatever that is, whether it's you know, my book or my podcast or the story of the company. So how are we supposed to do that in today's world of storytellers, getting those stories out there? Well, it's cliche, but we know that that content is king, right? Mm -hmm. So for starters, it's looking back and making sure that you have valuable content. I, I had the opportunity to, as, as, as I was building this agency, also own a, a radio show. That was a statewide, it was a syndicated show on ESPN. That's how I have my show on ESPN now is, is we were, and, and so I had opportunity to see how to tell stories in different ways and be engaging. So this would be a statewide show about a statewide football team that was on for four hours a day, wow. four hours a day, every day. So imagine what you're trying to talk about, like in, uh, like uh, in, in May, right? Or June, <laughs> no problem. Top yeah. rated show statewide because stories were being told the right way. So the yeah. content was good. I remember doing 7 a.m. breakfast with the, with the other two owners. One was the host, this, per, this big personality that was well, well known. He's on ESPN and other things. And, and, uh, and it was always about how do we craft a story that is relevant? 
what's happening out there that will be of interest. So make sure, number one, it always has, you can cut through the clutter if you have real content. Just like we still say good music will get through at some point. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they, there's me being kind of a music snob. It, it, I, was in, I was in Hollywood during the, when the crash of the labels happened. Mm-hmm. The, all my friends were on major labels. They were all bartenders and waiters and, and they were all signed to major labels. They did their childhood dream just like me. They got there, they made it, they got the signature. They, they were thinking, uh, they were thinking like Guns N' Roses days and all that. That's all gone, right? You get the deal. There's a $4 million bonus. You get out there and you're the rock star. And so, uh, but, but I still believe that there's enough platforms out there that if you have good content and you, you do some basic principles that you will get your content heard. Good things will still rise to the top. So first of all, number one, you have to make sure what you're doing has value to it. Don't just do something because someone tells you you're supposed to have a podcast. Don't put out a book because someone tells you you're supposed to have a book. I see too many people doing that. I see a lot of brands doing that. Well, we're trying to blog. I'm like, that's garbage. Some of it is just garbage. And, and so make sure it's quality. Make sure you know why you're doing it. What's your why in making the content. And then if you have all that, great. And then the other thing I teach the basics of marketing is I talk about the five crisis points in marketing in my book. Mm-hmm. I talk about understanding who you are, understanding really, really understanding who your target is, picking the right venues to reach them. Uh, using the right tools so that you're not dumbing down your campaign. You're not dumbing down your outreach, make your tools match. And I talk about making a plan and then having consistent execution. When those things are being done in, in, in the formula that I usually lay out, uh, you're okay with changes in landscape. It's going to happen because you just go and say, okay, well, great. I know who I am. I know who my target is. I know, I know where they're living. When you understand the world where your audience lives, you just pick and choose what they're consuming. If your audience tomorrow, Dan, all moves to Snapchat, guess what? You're moving to Snapchat. You will find a way. And somebody will build the technology to make it more accessible. And then when they move away from that, we'll find them the next place. We're going with them. So it's one of those things where we're saying, hey, you can leave, but we're coming with you, right? Yep. So if, if something changes, just have that mindset. And when you have that mindset, you, you get less stuck on the what and you get more stuck on the staying with them and and the how to go reach them. And you just, otherwise it's overwhelming to think of all the things that you can do. Don't do everything just because it's a new shiny object. I I like that advice. I I, I've used that myself. Don't, don't, you don't don't have to be everywhere, but test it and be where you think your audience is. We've got the gold rush of Alexa briefings right now, right? Oh man. Yeah. I'm doing it. (laughs) And I will say I'm very happy with it, but see, I knew that my target was going there. Mm-hmm. So we didn't panic. We're doing, we're doing podcasts. We're doing great. We've got a radio show that our content's growing. It's our tribe's growing and they're consuming it. They give us feedback that they don't like things sometimes, but they're consuming it and it's growing. But when we saw that they were moving to voice, we said, great, let's just go with them. Mm-hmm. And we move over to voice. It was easy. <laughs> so now we know where they are. Now, are we, am I trying to write blogs for my target? Oh, heck no. No way. We do have a blog that I would love for you to check out that my, one of our em, employees wrote, Taylor Burkhalter, who is actually a, a social media star himself. He's a, a, an influencer. And uh, he wrote a blog about why video content is so important. And he's got Donald Trump meme going from the guy who's writing a blog, right? But, uh, but, but other than that, we're, I'm not blogging that much because my target is really just not reading blogs. For SEO, all that, great. But I'm doing it for getting my content to the right people in the right way that they want to consume it. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. Create for people, not for uh, bots. Uh, We'll we'll link to Taylor's blog uh, in the show notes. So yeah. Cool. Um, So as uh, you've you've mentioned, even just in that, that, that explanation, um, author, your your book, don't buy a duck, your podcast, uh, business leadership series, your, uh, your radio show, your music, uh, all of these different ways to create music. Do you have a favorite way to tell a story out of any of that? Or just kind of depend on the story? Yeah, you know, for me, it depends on the story and it depends on, it depends on the story. It's a great question. Personal, professional. Professionally, I love talking. Mm. I just, I love telling stories and, and having a coffee and, and telling it that way. It just that energizes me and energizes others. And, and so, uh, so that's my favorite way. Uh, if it's on the art side, I love, I love helping others tell their story. And I've been a bass player and a, I was a professional backup singer for many years. And, and I loved helping other people tell their stories because that was just so rewarding too. So to help someone take it and make it more powerful, has just always been something I've been really passionate about. So it sounds to me like you're quite, you're, you'd probably be right up at the alley of servant leadership then, huh? I love servant leadership, but the reason that I here, <laughs> I was asked to uh, teach on it a few years ago for, oh. for this, this group called CEO global, which was an honor. I was honored to be able to do it. There's some big high level CEOs and I'm CEO by title at our little company, but I mean, these are some, these are some international CEOs that are speaking and I got invited to do it. I've done it for three years 
And, uh, and they said, I said, great, I'll do it. I'm an honored, but what do you want me to talk about? And they said, here's a program called servant leadership. And I'm like, well, yeah, I know what that is, but, and I started studying and I went, Oh no. So I had to go into our operations and go, we're, we're failing on some things. And that was kind of one of my quests, even with my podcast around the, that same time where I said, I'm a leader and I'm on an, an unintentional leader. I always want to be an entrepreneur. I love to build things, but I didn't necessarily want to lead a team. I know we're all leaders, but I didn't want, I didn't want to, I didn't want, I didn't feel like it. I want to build things and, and be left alone and then go build something else and, you know, and interject when I felt like it, but leaders don't interject when they feel like it. And so that even my podcast is the tagline is being an intentional leader. And so all of that went around servant leadership too, all the timing of it. So now I teach it and now I do practice it as much, as much as I can. Um, but it was something very learned for me. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. All right. So I, like I said earlier, I could geek out on, on this for hours, but I won't do that to, to you or our <laughs> listeners. Um, so I want to, I want to wrap it up with, with my, my favorite final question. Uh, I love to hear people's answers to this and I love, uh, I just, I, I'm, I'm excited to hear yours. Um, if you could only tell one more story as a storyteller, what would that be? Hmm. Specific one or co- type of content. I would tell a story uh, I would tell a story about music, art, and love, because I because I just think that's the most beautiful thing. So it, it would it would probably be uh, it would probably be about my family. Music and and love and family. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a kind of yeah. It, it, and and I love the answers so far out of out of both my seasons. It's been you know something specific or something like that. That's just a beautiful idea. Or it's I just I love that idea of what. Because to me, it gets down to what's important to you. Yeah. Right. So, and that changes cool. too, right? So, I mean, mm-hmm. two years ago, I would have told the probably would have told you a story about entrepreneurship and valor, and, and ten years ago, I probably would have told you about the coolest, you know, club I ever played, or you know, the biggest audience or the coolest musicians that I played with, and mm-hmm. and and but now, full circle for me right now is, is it's all about family, love, and 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 how how the art plays into that. Yeah, I just That's think it's beautiful. Cool. That's awesome, Derek. I appreciate that. Um, thanks for sharing your, your time with, with the listeners, with me and uh, for opening up like that. Um, where, you know, from, from don't buy a duck to the business leadership series to artist evolution, what's the best way to find you? Yeah. Th- thanks. Um, if you want to look at my book, it's don't buy a duck.com. It's on Amazon too. Um, I do tell some stories in there and there I tell stories about being a child. I tell stories and lessons. I give ex- specific examples about brands who've worked with that. It's really a marketing playbook. It's a, it's a, it's a how to avoid the five crisis points in marketing. So if you're interested in marketing business, I think there'd be something there for you. It's endorsed by Seth Godin. It's, it's done very well out there. It's selling and, and I'm, I'm really blessed that it's doing that. I love connecting on LinkedIn because it is currently a great platform. And uh, so look me up on, on LinkedIn, Derek Champagne, spelled like the drink. And uh, uh, otherwise, I've, I've got a business leadership series, blsnow.net or businessleadershipseries.com takes you to all of that content. Awesome. Yeah. And, and for the listeners, man, I'm telling you right now, go, buy, go get the book. Don't buy a duck, buy the book instead. Um, that was good, right? No. That's uh, awesome. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like you said, it's a marketing playbook. So it's great stuff. I, I really enjoyed it. So thank you. I appreciate thanks. it. Yeah, man. Well, thanks for your time, Derek. Uh, I appreciate it, man. Awesome. Dan, thank you, man. Great being a guest and I uh, love what you're doing. Man, that was incredible. And you know, it's funny because when I, when I start the recording, we just keep talking. I could talk to Derek for hours. So thank you so much, Derek Champagne, for uh, joining the Storytellers Network. Now, for those listening, be sure to visit Derek online. You can find links in our show notes that he mentioned. Uh, and if you enjoyed this episode, please consider, sh- consider sharing it all over the place. Uh, and if you know someone in particular who needs a little bit of help with marketing, share it with them too. Tag them or something because, man, Derek and his, his, uh, his story is amazing. Uh, you can share it to Twitter, of course, LinkedIn, as Derek mentioned. Uh, email, text it, wherever you you can share with other storytellers is always helpful. And also, speaking of helpful, consider leaving us a review in Apple Podcasts or iTunes if you want to call it that, uh, or wherever you listen to your podcast. We appreciate that. A big thank you to our partners here at the Storytellers Network, Casterly and Podcast Pilot. Thanks for making the world of podcasts a better place. Jamie J, Sarah Parrish, and the rest of the team, terrific humans, and you will be better off knowing them. Trust me. Without their support, the Storytellers Network would be just a dream instead of an episode number 14. Until next time, here's to telling our stories and having stories to tell. Cheers. Thank you.